Well, before I start, let me have a word of prayer with you guys. Uh, Father in heaven, um, I just feel the need that uh, um, we need your Holy Spirit here. We need the supernatural power that uh, only you bring, that strong movement, the energy of the third person of the Godhead, your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we just pray for that to uh, help me to remember (laughs) or give me words to say. And just, Lord, you know what every person here needs. So may you communicate that. And that's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. He will communicate to us in the very presence of Jesus what we need for today individually. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Boy, I have to say... um, I appreciate people's prayers. I was on, you know, the prayer line asking for prayers, and this week has probably been a really challenging week, really busy, um, and I'm probably less prepared than, than ever before to, to speak, but then someone said, hey, that's where the Holy Spirit works. Amen. So um, I, I wanted to do a PowerPoint, but everything just got in the way. I mean, just everything. You could ask Valerie. I, I got stuff in the bulletin, what, about 1 o'clock Friday afternoon. That's the latest I've ever done it. Because I was hoping, um, there's a, a friend of mine that has come to church here before uh, from the Fiji Islands, and he's, he's back in town. And he's going to come, but he wanted to put some, pic, uh, some uh, pictures together of what they're doing over there. They're starting new churches, branch Sabbath schools. I mean, it's like a Joshua. And so... I'm hoping in the next month he'll, he'll be here. To, and he plays guitar, plays music and stuff. But right at the last minute, uh, about 9 o'clock uh, Friday, he said, I can't make it. I don't have my, uh, the pictures together. So that's, that's what happened. But I wanted to, let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 3. And I trust and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to learn something new. We've, we've, we've read this before. I've read this before, but I've learned something new out of this that I want to share with you this morning. The wind blows where it wills, and that's the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to look at John chapter, we're going to spend most of the time in John chapter 3, but I'm going to jump around to some other uh, Bible verses here. But verse 1, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. Now, uh, he was part of the Sanhedrin, and that is equivalent to the Supreme Court. And boy, the Supreme Court, I mean, I just saw, I just saw yesterday when I was going home, uh, people protesting downtown, you know, about the Supreme Court. So there's going to be more of that going on. So he was part of the Supreme Court uh, to interpret law in those times. And he prided himself, like all the Pharisees did, they were they're very strict. They kept the letter to the law. And, uh, but you know, he wasn't satisfied with his life. He was, he, he, he was just, you know, is this really all there is to life? I, I don't know. And he saw Jesus come onto the scene. And the Holy Spirit was working in his heart because it says in verse 2, After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit drawing. If the Holy Spirit is working, he's drawing us to Jesus, right? He came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, and the other versions say teacher, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. We all know. Isn't that something that all the Pharisees, they all knew, it says here, we We know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. So he was thinking to enter into the discussion with with Jesus, but Jesus got right to the point. Verse 3, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Isn't that something? Have you ever been in a conversation with something and you're talking and and someone says something totally different than what you were talking about, it kind of would blow your mind. But here, Nicodemus was trying to enter into a discussion with Jesus, and he gets right to the heart of the matter. 
the fundamental truth of all Scripture. And uh, before this, before this study, Romans chapter 8 was my favorite chapter. Now it's John chapter 3. I think John chapter 3 is the most powerful chapter in all of Scripture. And hopefully when we get done, you're going to see why. What does it mean to be born again? The word again, if you look it up in your Greek, it translates there the definition born from above or born anew. It's to be born anew. Now, how does this, why do we need to be born again? Well, Psalms 51.5 says, For I was born a sinner. Yes, for a moment my mother conceived me. So we are born into sin. We've taken on the, the genetics and the inheritance of, and the nature of Adam and Eve. So we were born into sin. We have this sinful behavior. Yes, you know, you see as, as babies, and as they start to grow, it's all, the whole center of attention is me. I want to be fed. I want to be heard, right? And as you grow up, you learn that, um, that the, you get information from this world, from television, from people, of, um, of the lies that the devil is trying to say. You know, you, 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 you're in, um, in a sinful state, and you start practicing sin, right? We don't know. People don't know. We can't, and we can't just change uh, our behavior and start doing good. Right? Amen. We need to be born again. Yes. And um, I've been in this for, what, 35 years now, and, the, and there's three main reasons why people don't fully give their lives to Jesus. Number one, they're too busy. They're so busy and caught up in this, in this life that, that they don't have time. Number two, like the rich young ruler, oh man, I've got to give up some stuff. I don't want to give up some of these things that I'm, that I'm so wanting to practice. And we see a lot of that. And then number three, that when I, when I first gave my life to Christ, I spent a whole year going door to door and the, the most common uh, uh, comment was, hey, I'm a good person. I, I mean, these are some of the stuff that I do. I do this and this and this. And, but wait a minute, we're born into sin. We're sinners, right? So what, this, what these people are trying to say is, is hey, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't need this uh, being born again experience. I, I, I could just change what, my life that I'm living and start being a good person. But it says that we were born into sin. That's our very nature. We naturally want to do the things that are evil. Right? Amen. Romans 8, 7 and 8, it says here, the sinful nature is always hostile to God. And the, the King James says enmity, or at war. It never did obey God's law and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. See, that's the whole struggle, guys. We think that if, well, I'll just come to church. We think that, well, I'll just start um, trying to be, have more love in my life. I'll, I'll, I'll try to help people. I, I'm, I'm going to try to quit my, my addictions. It doesn't work like that. What a person needs is to be born again being born again. Because it says here that the sinful nature, by nature, is hostile to God. It doesn't want to. I remember when I was a kid, my mom would try to give me spiritual material to read, and I thought, this is boring. I don't want this stuff. Man, I want to go, I want to, go to a sporting event, or I want to go to the movies, or I want to, come on, this is boring. I was not, I, that's the, the sinful nature of, of us all. We don't understand spiritual things. And then the last one, 1 Corinthians 2.14. But people who aren't spiritual, that is, they're not born again, cannot receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what, is, what spiritual means. Have you ever been where you're trying to share with someone, and they go, wow, you're weird, or, or I don't even know what you're even talking about. 
This is what this is saying. Sometimes we get the cart before the horse, or however that is, however you say that, is the first thing is to, oh, well, I want to talk to him about the Sabbath. I want to talk to him about the state of the dead. I want to talk to him about even the correct way of being baptized. That's not the point. They need to be born again. You need to have a spiritual nature. Because if you don't, then the spiritual life is going to be boring. I don't want that. I don't want to be here. Oh, do I have to? It becomes duty. It becomes obligation. So what Jesus was trying to tell Nicodemus, it's not something that's just in theory, just knowledge. You need a new heart. You need spiritual regeneration. That's what you need. And we're going to talk about that. Verse 4. What do you mean, explained Nicodemus, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Here this guy had just kept the letter to the law and from when he thought he was perfect. And all of a sudden he comes to this, this, this Galilean that never went through the, the rabbinical school. He was taught by his mother, Mary. He's homeschooled. And so here he... he he cuts right to the heart, real deep. And he goes, what do you mean? Are you talking to me? What, what, what do you mean, be born again? Jesus replied, so this is beautiful. He doesn't get into any kind of argument. He just goes on and he, he reiterates. He says the same thing, but he explains what does it mean to be born again in more detail. Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of the water and the Spirit. Isn't that something? Verse 6, humans can produce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. So what he's talking about here is being born again is being born of the Spirit, which we understand is, I mean, being born of the water, which we understand is baptism, and being born of the Spirit. We, we emphasize the first one, and from, in myself, I thought about more on the baptism, and what I think we all do, than the second part, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Well, let's look, what does it mean to be born of the water? Now, hopefully, this is a one-time experience. Some people, I've been baptized more than once. But hopefully, it's a, a you know, uh, a one-time experience. Being born of the Spirit, as we're finding out in our prayer meeting, is a daily, continuous experience. Ephesians 5.18, it says, be filled with the Spirit. That word filled is an active verb that says continuously be filled with the Spirit. In Romans 8, 14, it says, be led by the Spirit. And that's the same, it's an active word, that it's an ongoing process. So here, what the experience of a lot of people is they get baptized in the water, they're born of that, and then that's it. And, and, and you come to church for years and years and years. That's exactly how I, you know, uh, that's been, been my experience, too, out of all sincerity. So what does it mean to be born of the water? Well, Matthew 3.11 says, I baptize, as John the Baptist says, with water, those who repent of their sins and turn to God. So being baptized is not joining a church or joining a social club or joining whatever. Being baptized is is an outward form or action of what is going on in the heart. You're wanting to tell everybody, hey, come to the wedding. I'm joining my life to Christ. I mean, can you imagine, you know, when, when we're fall in love that, that, oh, I'm not going to say nothing to anybody and we're just going to have this secret wedding and we're, I don't want anybody to know. That's not the way, way it happens, right? So the heart... The heart, it needs to be changed. The old habits, you, you remember 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. 
old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And that was my experience at 25. I was out at the, you know, nightclubs and partying, and, you know, I was a, a young, in the medical profession, I started making money, and I go, all right. But, you know, I, I'd go there, and afterwards, after having a whole bunch of drinks, it was like, oh, I had a hot hangover, I felt, I didn't feel good, and I said, I, I, I don't want to keep doing this. I don't want to do this anymore. Well, guess what? Next Friday night, hey, guys, let's go out. So it's, you get into, this, into this, uh, <laughs> this vicious circle, right? And so um, one day, for I don't, you know, different events started taking place in my life. And so one day, I thought, you know what? I'm going to give my life to Jesus. I had this tug of war going on in my mind. Am I going to stay out in the world, or am I going to go all the way with Jesus? And so I, I finally said, Lord, I'm going to give you my life. And what happened was there was people that said, hey, come on, let's go part. Oh, I don't want to be around you anymore. You're no fun. Well, I just wanted to read the Bible. I wanted to spend time with Jesus. So then it was a whole different experience. And so all of a sudden, I got new friends. Those friends said, I don't want anything to do with him. I mean, I was dating someone at the time that said, Man, I don't know what's going on with you, but I'm out of here. I wanted to just be with Jesus, you know? That's what it means to be born. And then, so I wanted to say in front of everybody, hey, I've given my life to Jesus. I don't want to live that old life anymore. I want to be a totally different person. So I want to be baptized. So I was baptized so people could see, hey, I'm no longer that other person. You know, and praise the Lord, but uh, my mom was a Seventh-day Adventist, but she wasn't a practicing Seventh-day Adventist. And she would, she would tell people, she goes, I don't even know my son anymore. Now, I took that in a positive way, but, you know, and she was probably going, I don't know what's going on with this guy. But <laughs> so what does it mean to be born of the Spirit. Now that is where I want to go next here. Um, the word born is the word, figuratively, it means to be regenerated. And what does regenerated mean? See, this is what I love about the Bible and learning new words and, you know, you look it up in the dictionary. In theology, the word regenerate is to renew the heart by a change of affections. To change the heart and the affections from natural enmity, that is, you know, at war, or not saying, I, this is boring, I don't like this stuff, to love God, to implant holy affections in the heart, to be born anew. Have you guys seen that? You know, one of the things that's just, to me, it's just, I just amazing is these uh, makeovers. These, uh, you know, on television where, uh, or, you know, it's the same word as renovate. And that's what this word regenerate means, is to renovate. You can see the before and the after. It's amazing. You can see this trash, uh, molded, you know, whatever house. And then we don't see all the work that goes into it. But it goes from that, and they show a picture of this, this beautiful, gorgeous inside of the house, right? That's what God wants to do through the Holy Spirit in each one of our lives. He wants to totally renovate, to change our lives. So how, do, how does that uh, work? It says here he wants to, the word renovate means to restore to the first state. Interesting. To, refor, to restore to the first state. Well, what, what was our first state as humans? Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That was our first state. We were made in the image of God. Isn't that something? We were the final act of creation. There's all these other forms of angels and you know, other creatures and stuff. But God says, hey, I want to create some humans that look and have are the character that we have. Isn't that something? Isaiah 43, 7, it says, I have created 
him, or that's, you know, it's man and woman, for my glory. We were created to reflect the character of God. I'm going to read this from education. This is really just, it summarizes what I'm trying to say here. Face-to-face, heart-to-heart communion with his maker was his highest privilege. And that's talking about Adam and Eve. Had he remained loyal to God, all this would have been his forever. Throughout eternal ages, he would have continued to gain new treasures of knowledge, to discover fresh uh, springs of happiness, and to attain clearer yet clearer conceptions of the wisdom, the power, and the love of God. More and more fully would he have fulfilled the object of his creation. More and more fully have reflected the creator's glory. But by disobedience, this was all forfeited. Through sin, the divine likeness was marred and well nigh obliterated. Man's physical powers were weakened. His mental capacity was lessened. Why? Today, I don't know of anybody, oh, I'm tired. And I heard this on our prayer line. The lady said, hey, look, because, you know, we see people dying all around us. And they said, you know what? If Jesus doesn't come back, we're all going to be dead. So seriously, we are degenerating. Our race is degenerating to where we could bear. I mean, I hear it all the time. Oh, I'm tired. I don't feel good. Oh, cancer here, cancer there, all these kind of things. The powers were weakened. His mental capacity was lessened. His spiritual vision dimmed. He had become subject to death, yet the race was not left without hope. By infinite love and mercy, the plan of salvation had been devised and a life of probation was granted. Here it is. To restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in creation might be realized. This was the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. The object of life is not to make millions of dollars. The object of life is not to be, to get so comfortable in this life that, you know, I don't need any other life. It says here, what's that? Education, page 15. So how are we born of the Spirit to restore in men and women the image or likeness of His Creator? Going back to the story, John 3, 8. The wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from and where it is going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. You know, it's interesting, the word wind and the word spirit are the same Greek word. So the wind is the Holy Spirit. That is what what they're talking about here is. So, you know, it's hard to tell sometimes where the wind's blowing. That is the same thing with the Holy Spirit. When a person says, I give my life to Jesus, it's been a long process where the Spirit of the living God has worked with someone over time to change the way they're thinking, to to like in my life, to, to put feelings of discontentment. Oh, I don't want that life anymore. I, I, I want something different. That is the Holy Spirit. And that takes time. That ta- it's not an overnight thing, the Holy Spirit, because, because he's not forcing us. He will not force any of us. But, you know, it's amazing, and I contemplated this. Um, in Joel uh, chapter 2, verses 28, it says here in these last days, that the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on all flesh. Everybody. Well, how can that be? Well, the Holy Spirit is working, but it's up to me if I'm going to choose to accept the Holy Spirit's leading. The Holy Spirit is working on everybody, every person. And I heard it, I heard it it's harder to be lost than it is to be saved. And the reason being is because you have to resist the Holy Spirit. I don't want that. And you do it over and over again until your heart is so hardened that you've um, um, grieved the Holy Spirit. That's what's called the unpardonable sin. And I've had that. I've had questions. Um, 
Some of you know I, I answer questions for BibleInfo.com, and I've had people go, oh no, I think I've, I've breathed the Holy Spirit away. Uh, is there any forgiveness for me anymore? And I said, just the fact that you're right me means that you have not grieved the Holy Spirit. Right? Genesis 1-2, it says here, this is beautiful. Who started creation? What person of the Godhead started creation? The Holy Spirit. Genesis 1-2, it says that the Spirit moved on the water. This place was empty. This was an empty place. It was dark. There was, there was water, I guess. And that was it here on this earth in the beginning of creation. Who is the first person to start recreation? The Holy Spirit, right? I heard this, and this isn't from me. This is, uh, I heard this from Ivor Meyer. This is, this is to me, Pastor Ivor Meyer, this is totally powerful. He was talking about music. The Father is the melody. Jesus is the harmony. The Holy Spirit is what? The movement or the beat. Isn't that powerful? That's in music. What about in redemption? The Father's song or melody is to redeem us as humans and take us and recreate in us to bring us back to the image of his likeness in the beginning. That is the melody. The harmony is Jesus. He's the mediator. The devil's there saying, no, you can't take that person. No, you know, hey, they've said, he's mediating. He's saying, no, my blood, my, I died on the cross for this person. So he's mediating for us. And what about the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit doing? The Holy Spirit is the movement or the drawing or the force behind it all. And it just, this has really opened up to me. I'll tell you what, this study has opened up me more than anything else in my whole life. I'm just, and so my mind goes to when the, the person that had went to all these doctors and no one would, could, she couldn't get healing, um, and she goes, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. And you remember, she touched the hem, and Jesus said, hey, someone touched me. What was that power? It was the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said, I could of my own self do nothing. So when Jesus was baptized of the water, you know, you can see it, in, I think it's in Luke 3, right after he got baptized of water, he knelt down and prayed, and what happened? He was baptized by the Holy Spirit. The dove came down and descended on him. Why did Jesus go out with such power and miracles and healing? It was the Holy Spirit. And that's, in our life, you know, I'm just, more and more, we, we, you know, and I've done this, I've been, we create all these programs. Hey, we're going to go, you know, evangelize. We're going to do this and that. Hey, wait a minute. Where is the Holy Spirit? It's the Holy Spirit that does the moving. Lord, help me to be filled with your Holy Spirit. So how does this renovating process work? Jesus says in John 16, 8, when he, that is the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world of sin. And John 16, 13, it says that he will guide us into all truth. John 14, 16, and 26, the Holy Spirit is a comforter. So this is how it works. Uh, through like a story, or like an impression on your mind. I've had this happen so many times lately. Someone shared me this story. You know, such and such did, did this to me, and it really hurt me. And in my mind, I go, oh, no, I did the same thing to such and such. I did not realize how much I hurt them. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. He's given us truth. I'm selfish. You're... You know, what you're saying, you're, 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 um, 
you know, being angry here, you're, you're being argumentative, you're being debate, whatever it is, through stories, through the word of God. And we, we, come, we come and repent, oh Lord, I'm sorry. That's where the comforter comes. You know, the Holy Spirit is an all-in-one. You go to Walmart to, 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 to get your, your, your meds, you go to Walmart to get your, uh, you know, your uh, toothpaste, and you go to Walmart to get your food. It's an all-in-one shopping center. That's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. I, I honestly, I have underestimated this gift of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit does it all. That is the movement. That's the force behind a change in a person's life. When any time that we go, man, I want to do better, I want to, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit trying to draw, draw us. And 1 John 1, 7, if we're walking in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And so it's a process. Oh, man, do I got to love my enemies? Oh, man, I could love someone that loves me, but... And how many times have I heard that lately? And I've heard that through some other people's experiences. Oh, I can't, I can't stand that person. Well, wait a minute. The Holy Spirit says, love them, love them. Oh, man, Lord. Well, the Holy Spirit says love. Okay, you're going to have to do it for me. You're going to have to put love in my heart and life. I can't do this. That's the rental baiting process. So when you think about a makeover of a home that looked just this, you know, moldy, all this trash and everything, and then afterwards you see this beautiful, that is what the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is trying to do to each one of our lives, is to try to recreate in us his image. Because Jesus came at the darkest time, the first time. People were discontent. They had a lot of the stuff. Yeah, I mean, they didn't have nuclear war like we, you know, uh, could have today. But there was all these things going on. It was one of the darkest hours. Jesus came. He came down to this earth to show us what the Father's character is like. So Jesus goes back. He tells his disciples and us, I'm going back into heaven. I want to give you the Holy Spirit so that you can reveal my character to the world. That is exactly what's happening right now. The world is waiting for a people, the Bible calls them the 144,000, that say they're going to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. That means they're going to, oh, yes, Lord, oh, man, okay. I don't know how I'm going to love my enemies, but your Holy Spirit, you've, 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 you've spoken to my heart, so you've got to do it. And I have to say, in my own heart, when I start praying for my enemies, I start kind of liking them and kind of loving them. It's the Holy Spirit that's, 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 going, to do, that's going to change the way we're thinking. And see, that's the renovating process. To unwind or unthink all those things of this world, to get rid of that, and to put in our lives the likeness or the character of Jesus. Those thoughts, those feelings, those, you know, that, that particular type of life. So going back to the story, um, it says here, and I was saying in verse 8, the wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from and where it's going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. So Nicodemus again goes, verse 9, how are these things possible? This is powerful right here. Verse 14. And Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For Verse 16, for this is how God loved us. He gave his, all, his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. Powerful insights. Nicodemus, he did not right at that time at that interview come out and say, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. 
it's been it, three years. It took three years for you to see any fruits of what that, uh, me, that, that meeting they had. And it wasn't until he saw Jesus hanging on the cross that it really hit him and said, this is the Messiah. And afterwards, it says that he was the first one there to, one of the first ones there to embalm, not embalm the body, but to bring, to honor, to bring, you know, expensive spices and all those different things. And as we know in history and, and Desire of Ages brings this out, that, that he gave all his money to the new church that was starting the Christian church. And he followed Jesus all the way. So the secret, I know in my life, I was in, I was, uh, in an evangelistic meeting, and the, the evangelist was making an appeal, and he was talking about the cross. And I was thinking to myself, all those things that I have in my life that I struggle with, the addictions that I have, Right now, I'm so focused on the cross, so saying, oh, Jesus, you did that for me. All those things don't matter anymore. All those addictions, all those things don't even matter. I am here right before you, before the cross. That's the secret. That's the motivating power to be born again. That's what he wants to do in each one of our lives. So I don't know how many people... um, have been baptized by water. But I want you to really seriously think about it if you haven't. And it's not just to join a church. It's more than that. It's it's, it's a change of heart. God wants to change and to to make us new, a new creature, to, to do away with our old life and start a whole new life in Jesus. And then I encourage each of you, which this is just powerful to me, was... I want to be born of the Spirit, too. That is all part of the born-again process. So let's listen to this uh, song here, and then I'll have closing prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you for uh, the beautiful message that Nicodemus must have told John later on in life that is recorded in the Bible so that all of us could understand that the fundamental truth, the deep, hidden meaning of, of, of salvation and, and the experience that he wants with each one of us is that he wants to, that he wants us to be born again of the water and of the spirit. For it says that if we don't, if we're not, if we don't, are not born of that, then it says they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Because heaven would not be a place where, oh, that, that's all boring, I don't want to be there. Lord, we need that spiritual nature. We just ask and plead for that in each one of our lives. And and I just uh, want to make a a call to those that have not really um, given their life to Christ fully and been baptized by water, that the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart. And, And also to those that have not been, like for myself, have not daily asking for the feeling of the Holy Spirit, the working of the of being born of the Spirit. So Lord, just just continue to work in each one of our lives. And I know you're coming soon because I see and hear how you are working in people's lives. And that just brings encouragement. And so Lord, we just we we don't want to leave here the same people. We want to leave here changed. So we just ask that you, through your Holy Spirit, that we surrender everything. Absolutely, we give it all to you. All that's yours, Lord. And we thank you for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.